Lunchtime Heroes is brought to you in part by Calavo Growers, the family of fresh. Harvest Hold from Verdant Technologies. Volcano Produce, erupting with freshness. And Produce Careers, we are in the people business. Hey, everybody. How are you? I'm glad. I hope it's a fantastic day. I'm having a good day. Eric's having a good day. Tony's having a good day. We're happy that you're here hanging out with us again once, once again on Lunchtime Heroes, talking about ways we can all work together, think together, come together about changing the way we feed our children in school, why it matters and, and, and the consequences of why it matters, whether it be their health, whether it be their longevity, whether it be the climate, whether it be all kinds of things we could talk about around this. And I'm thrilled to have my guests with me today. And we're not going to waste any time with me babbling on my soapbox. We're going to get to what Eric has to say, because that's really what matters, because he's got the details that you all need to hear. So please, everybody, give it up for the Director of Nutrition Services at Sweetwater Union High School District. Please, everybody welcome Eric Spann. Sir, pleasure to have you. Thank you for inviting me. This is a pretty awesome platform and love what you're doing. And, uh, you know, again, what, what, a, what a better way to start a Friday heading into a weekend and talking about kids and food, right? Like, you know, you can't script it any better than this. Well, I'm, I'm telling you, you're preaching to the choir here. I, find, I, I really firmly believe and our company believes and, and the people inside of our company have all gotten our heads wrapped around how incredibly important this conversation is to our country and to our youth and to our future, right? Because one of the things, and, and before we get rolling here, and I'm just because you gave me the runway, it's time for everybody to understand that as we grow and we gain wisdom in our lives, passing it backwards is more important than perhaps what you do with it going forward. And being able to take some of these conversations like we're having and look at our kids and what it means to them and what it means to our future as a country and it means to a whole lot of other things is incredibly powerful. So another thank you for being here and hanging out with me today. I think it's going to be fun. We're going to have a great conversation. So let's get rolling, brother. If you wouldn't mind, just tell everybody a little bit about yourself and what your role is at Sweetwater, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. I'm the uh, Director of Nutrition Services for Sweetwater Union High School District. Uh, I've been in my role for 10 years. It'll be 11 years in March. I've been in school food for almost uh, 18 years now. And uh, prior to that, um, I am, you know, a lot of time in food, uh, in the food business. So I'm a restaurant chef. I've been a classically trained chef. I've worked in food service since I was 17. Uh, so I've worked across the country in hotels, hospitals, and freestanding restaurants. So uh, I have a really good uh, immersion into food and and I've been able to be successful in bringing that to uh, Sweetwater Union High School District. I love that. I love the perspective that you're bringing, right? It, it's that wider swath, to your point. Train chef, you know what it is. You know how a kitchen runs. You know how a kitchen runs for profit. You know how a kitchen can, you know, can grow broke real fast, right? right. And there's a lot of really cool things coming. So let's, let's get into the, what's going on at Sweetwater. Talk to me a little bit about how many kids you're feeding a day, a week, a year, whatever. Sure. Um, well, you know, here in California, we have universal free meals. So um, everybody in our state eats for free. Uh, we have seen an increase uh, in our uh, meal service program. So we're up to about 27,000 meals and that's included breakfast, lunch, and supper a day. Uh, we're doing about 135,000 meals a week and roughly ends up to about 4.5 million meals over the year. Uh, it's just so a few. Yeah, just a few, just a few. Just a few. That's, just a few. That's, <laughs> We've been successful with it. Um, we're seeing a lot of growth, though. It's really interesting is, is in our really low free and reduced sites. And so yeah. I, I attribute that to the fact that kids like our food. <laughs> so well, look, that's 100% of what everybody has said to this date about these conversations is that, you know, the, the days, and I go back to when I was getting, you know, that piece of cardboard pizza with, with ketchup on it is not winning the day. And that's why kids aren't eating it. That's why kids are not in the, in the cafeteria. That's why the kids are bolting outside because the food isn't something that's really overly appealing. So before we dive in and get start some of that process, I think it's really important for people to understand what you're working with when it comes to how much money you have to spend per kid per meal. Because it's fascinating to me when you start to peel this back a little bit. Yeah. Peel the onion back. Well, there's a food joke I didn't think I had in my wheelhouse today. But talk to one. me. Thank you, bro. I try hard. You know, I, I try to be I try to be cutting edge with everything I do. Talk to me a little bit about the money you've got to spend. Yeah. So that's a, that I think was probably the biggest shock coming from the restaurant hotel world and the schools. 
and realizing that the, the actual budgeted amount that you had to spend on food was so small. Uh, and so when we look at what we, you know, are spending on, on the plate, we're, we're averaging about $1.75, $1.80 uh, just on what goes on the plate. But uh, we also have to take into account that we had to do a little something different than most districts do. Uh, and what we found is that by going direct, by developing relationships with manufacturers, by developing relationships with our local farmers, we can get products into our school district uh, at a cheaper price, but also a, in, a, in a model and a method that we would be able to use to cook and prepare our own meals. So we do a lot of scratch cooking, uh, not as much as we used to do coming uh, prior to COVID, but we're moving back into that into that frame of, uh, of how we used to operate. And so mm -hmm. that, again, allows us to draw down the cost of, of what that center of the plate item looks like. Yeah, doll. I mean, under two bucks. I mean, bottom line. Think, and and that's a, I think that's the thing that I try to stress so much to everybody is think about that. Go think about feeding yourself at home for under two bucks. Yes. Right. I mean, yeah, you can drive through someplace and hit that 99 cent menu, but go ahead and then do the nutritional analysis of what is in that 99 cent menu meal. Right. And recognize that that is not the way to be feeding our kids today, especially at school when they're trying to learn and trying to grow and develop and create friendships and bonds and learn what life is all about in that experience. It's mind boggling to me what you all work with. Yeah. I mean, and then, you know, you think about it, you touched on it earlier, right? That we are, we are a business. Uh, we're the only self-funded operation on a K-12 school site. Uh, all the money that we bring in via reimbursement pays for salaries, food, equipment, uh, any kind of repairs that need to go on. And in some cases, you know, we pay the, the district uh, for electricity, water. So we are a business. And you look at what our reimbursement rate is and what we actually have to work with, that drives down a lot, I think, for, for directors. They have to make some hard, hard choices at times because the amount of money that we're working with is so small. Yeah, there's no way. You know, and in past shows, we've talked about, you know, people, oh, we have, you know, $5.12. But then we back it all out to electricity, trucks, labor, insurance forks, plates, food costs, blah, blah. And it's like it, right back to where you are. I mean, it's literally pennies to feed people when you want to think about it, yes. right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's not even 200 pennies we're talking about with what you're doing, right? And that's a, a crazy way to look at it, but it's it's reality. And that's why I think this platform is so important to keep these conversations going. So let's get into a little bit about the changes that you've made, right? That's, that's what I love to talk about the most is, you know, what changes have you made to your food program that these kids are, you know, falling in love with now? Well, I can tell you when I first started, um, you know, I, I did a really deep evaluation of our menu. Um, I went out and I talked to students and talked to parents and talked to teachers and uh, our community members, and they were, were not happy with the quality of the food that we were serving. Uh, right. So I just, you know, set, set down a methodical pattern of, of how we're going to look at what the ingredients are in our food. Um, I started meeting with uh, our manufacturers because when I started, we had a, a lot of companies that seemed like they had an open door to walk in and bring a sample. And then that sample would end up on the menu. And for me, I, I didn't see a lot of care into what those ingredients were like. So um, in that first year, it was really um, honing in on what, what our mission was going to be, which is feeding kids good food. Uh, and that the whole mission is we want to support the educational opportunities for our students by providing them the highest quality food possible. And so when I started to do a deep dive into what the food, you know, they had been eating, uh, the ingredient decks of those foods, I said, okay, we gotta stop. Uh, so what I did is I set, here's the standards of what must be in the food, what mm -hmm. can't be in the food. And then I started to weed out uh, manufacturers who couldn't meet that. So I went from probably, you know, like I said, 15 people or so coming in, to, you know, I only reached out to you if I knew that your food met the quality standards that we had. Uh, and then we started to, again, really dig into, uh, at the time, I was very lucky that one of my uh, other area supervisors was also a trained chef. And we started looking at how we could purchase food that fit what we wanted. So we started developing techniques to go directly to manufacturers and, and distributors who would have access to raw food, for example, like let's say Applebee's ordered a five ounce chicken uh, 
uh, breast, but you know, when they're cutting them on the line, sometimes they're eight ounces, sometimes four ounces, and we would buy those miscuts. And so those miscuts would then start going into our chicken Caesar salads. They start going into our Fredo bowls. So we basically changed the, the, the actual quality of the food. And then we saw a steady increase in our reimbursement rate. We saw a steady increase in the amount of positive feedback we received from parents. Uh, we started, you know, taste testing with parents, not only just students. Yeah. Taste testing with parents. Uh, because, you know, the old line is, uh, you know, kid is always going to say, hey, food at school sucks. So I need some money to go buy, you know, X, Y, and Z. And when parents started tasting our food, which was funny, is they were like, wait a minute, my kid is telling <laughs> my kid's not being honest about uh, the quality of the food. And so it's been a process for us, but I, I think that we've we've got a really good formula. Uh, well, no, so, two ways. Oh, yeah, no. Two, well, I think, no, no. I was going to say, I want to come alongside about the parents, right? Because I think that's one of the questions I automatically that I want to know is like, what have you heard from the parents? And you've just illustrated that the parents are involved and that's, that's unique. Not everybody's doing that. Not everybody's getting that taste test opportunity. I think it's so important because you get the parents by it, but more importantly, you're also educating the parents about good food. Exactly. You're also sitting there reinforcing what they could cook at home. You know, one of the cool stories that have come out of this was, was somebody was sharing how one of the parents called uh, the school was saying, Hey, where do I find this? My kid wants this at home and I don't know where to go get it. Yeah. You know, that's powerful. So yeah. talk to me a little bit about the parents. If you, if you got some other you know stories to share. Yeah, I do. I uh, just thinking about this one. We're at a, um, we're at a, a kind of a food fair at, at a popular mall that we have here. And, and, you know, we're tasting again, ta we're just to tossing out our product, man. You know, we want you to know what we're serving to your kids. And I had a, a couple of families ask me, Hey, can you, can you take over providing the, the food for our elementary kids? And I said, well, I, I can't because that's not my district, but by the time they get to our, our, our middles and, and high schools, then I have them. But I, that, that made us feel good. But also the, the thing that came out of that was looking at our staff because we had staff members there. And so sure. when our staff is hearing from parents how they like what we're serving and we want more of what you're serving, then it, it, it's a pride uh, button for our staff. It makes them feel good. And then it's easier again for us to then ask them to do a little bit more, like a little bit more, like, hey, we're going to, we're going to cook some raw chicken. You know, we're going to cook some raw beef. We're going to make ceviche. We're going to, you know, do some noodle ramen bowls. We're going to do a little bit more than, you know, just opening packages and, and putting them on trays and serving kids. But first, you got to build up the staff to know that uh, what they're doing is worth it and that is valued. And, and, and so those interactions with parents are, are really good. Uh, another thing that we do is, you know, there's always a back to school night at uh, each of the campuses. And so our site supervisors, again, they take us samples of, of food that we serve the students. They go to the back to school nights. The families then have an opportunity to taste the food um, when they're on campus. So, you know, we're just, again, trying to, you know, build bridges with our parents, you know, increase the contact and, and input from our students. Uh, and then, you know, just educate our administrators and the public around us um, the food that we're serving. And also, you know, here's some of the challenges that we may have. I absolutely. And I want to talk about challenges. I think that's really something that people can, because that's the learning, right? You know, you're, you're reaping the benefit. You're seeing that success now, but the challenges is what you had to overcome to get to that, right? It's, it's yeah. like running the opposite. It's like, hey, I got to the finish line. Great. But it's how'd you get there is what I want to get into a little bit. So talk to me a little bit about, I'm going to give you a kind of a two-part question, if you wouldn't mind, and just run with it, run with it any way you want. But how hard was it a, to change your program. And then the follow-up to that would be, talk about some of the biggest hurdles you had to overcome in that. I mean, that's a great question. That's a great question. Try not to have crappy questions. I try no, to go but, hard yeah. to paint. <laughs> no, I like it though. I mean, because, it, you know, again, I, I'm hoping that for directors that are out there uh, that might, you know, that might be struggling. Um, a lot of it is, was changing the mindset of the employees. Wow. You know? and, and, and because... One, when I took over the district, you know, we had we had a lot of turmoil. We had a lot of, uh, you know, bad actors in the past that had been in the department. And so the morale of um, of our team was low. And so for the first time, you know, one of the first things I did was I convened a all staff meeting and I made that an annual 
event that we would get together as a team from our area supervisors to our, our, our site supervisors to our cooks or assistant twos and then to our, our production team, we would all meet and we would all, you know, really talk about positivity and why we uh, are doing what we're doing. Uh, and then the second part was training. Like I can't ask people to do, you know, this high level now food prep when we're not giving them the skill set. Uh, so what we started to do is bring in chefs uh, to train our staff on knife skills. We actually bought knives. Um, you know, we do a, a knife rotation uh, service like we would do in our restaurants that I was in. And But we taught them how to cut. We taught them how to use a knife. We taught them, hey, we're going to cook chicken. We're not going to break down raw chicken, but we're going to show you how to do it. So you can take this skill at home. And so when we started talking and teaching them and, and, and really emphasizing, hey, these are things that you're already doing at home. You know, none of us are pulling out some pre-cooked chicken and putting it on a tray and feeding our kids that or pulling out some pre-cooked hamburgers and feeding our kids with that. So we started training them, one, you can be safe in how you handle the food. So we built confidence in them. And then we gave them the training and then we continue to coach and support them as we started to really implement our program. And so I think that's the first thing was, was really changing the mindset. Wow. And then I'll tell you this, um, I have 21 new supervisors out of 23. Wow. So we turned over quite a few people. So, you know, people who realized that they were not ready for the change, you know, they were nice to step out of the way and, and allow the people who were eager and, and ready to go and to step up into those roles. Uh, and then, and that really helped. And I'll tell you this too, in, in my department, we have 250 employees, only two people work in my district in, in, in this department that did not start as substitute employees. And that would be myself and that would be our registered dietitian. Everybody else from site supervisors, to area supervisors, to cooks, all started as substitute employees. And we had an internal training program that grew our uh, staff organically. And again, I think that helps to build stability. It also helps to you know, really tie uh, the employees and, and our team members to the sites that they work at, but also to the department, and then ultimately to the students that we serve. Huge. So I love the angle and it's, it's, it's killer. Your staff has to be embracing this. They have to be feeling uplifted. That has to be, you know, you're, you're just, I don't know. I, and I, my vision in my mind is just, just, you know, this long assembly line of just, you know, scoop of this onto the tray type of deal. It's a different world, right? I mean, I, I think about when I was a kid, what was school like, you know, what it was just, they, they weren't, you know, it, it was what it was. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be now that these folks are fired up to come to work because they can see what the changes have to be. Because you know, which leads me to my next question is how are these kids responding to the change? Right. Because now you've got a motivated staff that's into this. Right. You've uplifted them into the process, you know, which is which is so powerful. Right. That's your frontline messaging right there. Mm -hmm. But talk to me a little bit about how the kids are communicating back to you about what's going on. You know, the kids are man, the kids are awesome. Um you know, one of the things that, that I've seen happen and that I'm very proud of is that our vegetarian and vegan students are vocal. Like they 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 come up, man, and they're like, look, <laughs> we need we need some we need to get in on this action um, and we need to be in the cafeteria. and We need to have some food that represents, uh, you know, our our station in life right now. And so uh, we've done a great job of listening uh, we've gone to, you know, surveying. Uh, we had some apps that we can shoot messages directly to the students on what the menus are to kind of speed up uh, their choices, but also talk about what the food is, you know, using announcements on, on school campuses, but really saying, hey, to that kid who comes in and they have a complaint about the food, okay, well, then we'd like you to sit on this panel uh, to taste test some items that we're gonna be looking at to go on the menu. So then we are able to turn that student, you know, into uh, what we hope uh, is a positive ambassador for our meal program. And so we've really been able to, to see some success. 
And again, after COVID, we kind of had, you know, we have, we're building back up that program, but anything that goes on the menu now has to have like an 80% rate of success with students uh, when they, they taste it. So um, I want to actually give the power now to the, the students to develop what our, what our menus are going to look like. That's powerful. Because again, you know, because not only are you bringing the kids alongside, but you're allowing kids, which is something that I don't think we do enough of in a lot of ways. We don't always have give kids enough opportunity to make choices, yeah. right? We make a lot of choices for them. And I understand that as a parent, right? And I mean, I'm, I, I got my, I have my, you know, my, my dad hat on. I can see all that. I remember, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also incredibly empowering for these kids to feel empowered. And something as simple as food is a great way for that to happen. And again, you're educating these kids about investing in themselves, investing in their future, investing in their peer groups and what's happening. I can't even imagine what these kids are going to be like in 10 years when they're out there, you know, on their own doing their things, the involvement that they're now going to have into the food cycle, which, which is exactly why I think this, this conversations and what you all are doing is so important because of what the seeds you're planting for the future about changing our food narrative, because so much happens when we change food, climate can change. Our health can change, right? A lot of things can po change positively for our country and for this world by how we treat agriculture and how we treat food. It's incredibly powerful, man. What a great message you just laid on us. That's you know, awesome. You, know, you talked about it earlier. It's like, you know, you get to a certain point in your life where, you know, you get a little older, a little wiser, and you realize it's really not about you. You know, it's not, it's not about me. Um, what I do is centered on my team, is centered on the students that we serve, uh, you know, in my district and ensuring that, you know, the light around our district is, is a positive one. Uh, it's really not about me. I, I just happen to be lucky enough to work in, a, in an industry and in an environment and a district and a department. I just love to do. I love what I do. And so I just want to make sure that, you know, what I'm giving and and offering on a daily basis is supporting that person behind me, right? Uh, and I, and I, I, not to, you know, um, pat myself on the back about it. Pat away, I, brother, pat away. You deserve it, go. Well, I say I've had really good leaders. I've had, yeah. you know, when you look at what, what allow you to be successful is the people who have allowed you to be successful and the people who have helped you to be successful. And right. I've been very lucky to have worked with some great people uh, that gave me the room to grow. And so, I just want to pass that. I just want to pass that on. That's really what my role is right now. How do we? That's, how do I help nutrition services be um, elevated the way that it should be uh, in our country? And and you know, yeah, we can think globally, but how do we do it? How do we do it in our country? Yeah, hundred percent. And you're uplifting. You know, look, you're uplifting your staff. You talked about that. That's a whole different thing. You're including the children. You're uplifting them. You're including them in the conversation. I mean, God. I mean. How you're serving these kiddos is killer, man. I mean, it's awesome. It's so, it's incredibly powerful. And I think that's the thing I keep trying to say over and over again is the power of what it is that you're doing and the power of change that you're making. How, what the seed you're planting today in these kids, I, 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 I hope in 10 years, you and I have a conversation about this kid or that kid or what it really actually meant. How many kids take advantage? You know, I mean, they've got to be more kids taking advantage of what you're throwing out there now, what you're serving, I would imagine, from start to finish. Well, talk to me a little bit about that because of the quality of the food you're, throwing, you're giving them. Yeah, you know what's funny? It's really funny, right? So our greatest growth that we see is in our sites that were low, free, and reduced. Mm -hmm. And so one, one of the benefits of universal free meals that I, I love is that it takes that stigma away from, um, you know, are you a free and reduced kid? Are you a paid kid? So it's not, it's not that now is, are you a hungry kid? Yeah. And so that's like simple, right? So when you just can get to that little core principle of, are you hungry? And if so, hey man, we got this beautiful th uh, food for you. And so our, our, our growth is just, I mean, it's exploded. So we've gone at one of my high schools, for example, I have almost 3,000 students on, on this campus, and we were averaging maybe three, 400 meals a day at the site prior to Universal Free Meals going in. And right now we're averaging almost 1,000 meals a day uh, for just lunch that we're serving. Right. And so that growth, you know, one, our free and reduced students who have been there didn't want to eat because they didn't want to be shamed. 
Uh, those kids are now taking advantage of the program. Those, you know, kids who uh, were paid students or may had a, you know, a little bit of change in their pocket and didn't want to come in the cafeteria. Now they're now they're blowing the doors off uh, of us to to get into the cafeteria. And so our meals are up. Um, you know, again, I, I, it's, you know, it's just really uh, impressive to see how just a change, right? Like feeding kids, like, oh, we're going we're gonna to feed everybody. And then to see how many kids take advantage of that. Right? Yeah, it's huge. It's, again, it's, it's incredibly powerful. And I get universal meals, but let's be honest. If you're putting the cardboard pizza out, you're still going to be at 300. It has a lot right. to do with what you're putting on the plate and what you're allowed to put on the plate and the vision that you have and your staff has about incorporating good, real food into these kids' diets. And, and I think it's incredibly important. And one of the things I ask everybody is talk to me a little bit about the feedback on any physical, mental, or behavioral improvements that you're seeing with these kids. And I'll share with you uh, something somebody shared with me. They're actually looking at the amount of time that the kids are sitting together eating and they're sitting there eating. At times they don't have enough time because they're talking, they're conversing. The meal's not getting scarfed down. They're actually eating. They're actually enjoying each other's company, which I think is an incredibly powerful lesson, especially at elementary school level. Well, um, just so you know, we're we're all middle and high school, so it's a little it's right. a little different. But one one factor um, that I can tell you is, I don't get a lot of calls from the nurse that you know a kid needs to eat, right? So um, we see now that you know we are we're we're maxing out our ability to feed students, but we're also not getting calls from parents about them not eating. We're not getting calls from, from uh, uh, nurses saying that, um, hey, you know, Johnny's got a tummy ache or he didn't get to eat. You know, we know that the kids are getting food. Um, and, you know, as far as the, like the other behavioral part, um, I haven't received that information yet. But in the factors that I know were, uh, uh, you know, really, um, you know, forefront for us, I'm not seeing that anymore, you know. Yeah. That's powerful. I mean, but that that speaks, to, but that speaks to everything we've just covered, right? It, again, I, I think it's a way. In my mind, I ask that question because it's a way of kind of showing an immediacy of your result, right? Yes, your meals are up this snap, but you know those those things are powerful. When you start talking about, and I think it's imper- I'll back up before I continue, but I think it's really important that people remember there's a lot of kids that get their last good meal on Friday until they come back on Monday, and that's real. And you think about, you know, I think about when I was a kid. To your point about, oh, you know, kids going to the office because they have stomach ache. That's not because they have an ulcer. That's not because their appendix are coming out. It's because they're hungry. Exactly. Right. And we don't realize that. And that's a powerful statement you just made. And I think it's really important that people put that in the back of their mind. We start thinking about not throwing the cardboard pizza in front of the kids because that's not feeding a kid. Right. That's just that's just blocking something in their brain. That's not making the day go better for them in a lot of ways. And that's why I think it's so powerful the way you're looking at food and approaching food as the value that it really is to our lives and our health and everything else that's included. It's powerful. Yeah. You know, I I can tell you this, and I I just thought about this one that I think is, is key. Like what we're seeing is that kids now are in our district waking up to the importance of food. Right. So what we've seen in the last two years are kids that are coming up on multiple campuses and they're like, Hey, uh, Mr. Spam, we want to we want to save this food. You know, we see some kids throwing that food in the trash. Uh, we want to rescue it. We we have a plan. And so um, I started working with some students at one high school on how to rescue the food. So not only are they uh, empowering themselves to talk about, hey, you know, to their colleagues, you should eat, you know, their peers, you should eat, eat this food. But if you're not going to eat it, let's put it in this box. This box is then going to go and be saved and then donated to a community organization where there's hunger. Uh, And then we're feeding kids and families in the community as well. And so I think that, you know, kind of all of this, right, like we don't think about how when you're touching a a kid in regards to providing some quality. Hey, did you know this apple came from this farm that, you know, they have a low, uh, low spray you know, they're treating past, you know, pesticide, you know, they're mm-hmm. pest control, they're doing very minimal, they're doing real natural um, uh, light touches on how they, how they handle pests. 
they're not over spraying. And then you start talking to kids well, as they come through the, you know, to the line, we're taste testing. Now this is valuable food to them. And so what we're finding is that, hey man, uh, we like to rescue this food. We can donate it and give it to someone. Um, hey, the, the scrap food, um, you know, we can look at, can we get it to some animals first? And then also what's left, can we compost? And that's what we're starting to see from one district two years ago, once can be one school site two years ago, we now have six schools that are operating this program. And then we have uh, at least two more that are waiting. And now we have our, our elementary feeder district reaching out, asking how they can participate in the program. So, you know, I, I just think it's just, man, this is a kid's world and I, I want I want to help them do everything that they can to make sure the planet is 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 ready for them and safe for them. And but they know that they they have power and they have a voice and uh, we just want to help to facilitate it. Well, 100%. And it's like I said before, it's the wisdom that we can take downstream, right? Because these are the next leaders. These are the people that are going to run for office. These are the people that are going to be in your churches. These are going to be the next doctors and lawyers and whatever else it may be on their in their path of life, right? But the foundation that you're building around food and common sense and giving back, I mean, the lessons you're teaching these kids today, dude, I mean, that's, that's how we win the day, right? That's what we need to be doing, right? And, and, and kudos to you and your staff. I mean, that's not an easy lift, but look at the trajectory that you've done just through school food. That's powerful, brother. So what's next for you guys? Is there anything exciting coming up? I mean, obviously you're working downstream with the elementary school, which I think is fabulous, but anything else coming? Sure. Uh, so we um, were recipients of a California Department of Food and Ag uh, incubator grant. Um, and this is something that we've been kind of working on in the 10 years that I've been here is to create uh, a program I call Micro Local because uh, everyone's about local produce and local food. Uh, our next thing is to set up systems where we can start growing food on our campuses that are then going to go into the cafeterias. Uh, so that's something that we're starting. We're re redoing uh, our what we call our pilot farm project. Uh, at one time, we had about 400 chickens on, on that campus, and those eggs were coming into uh, the, the meal program. Uh, so we're looking to expand on that, also start a, a kind of hatchery program so that we can start putting those chicken coops on multiple school campuses. Because again, when kids are aware of where the food comes from, when they know, uh, you know, these gardens on campuses are, are also then going to go into the cafeteria, they're they're more in tune and more tied into where, you know, what, what they're going to be eating. Uh, and then secondly, man, you know, it's just increasing our, our recruitment of employees. Uh, so that we can get back to and even ex exceed our scratch cook model. You know, we want to really get back to uh, doing our crazy things like grilled cheese on actually doing it on a grill, you know, not 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 in an oven, but actually out front with in front of the students grilling grilled cheese sandwiches. Like we want to we want to get back to that kind of innovation and fun. Uh, so that's our next big push. Drop the Sharpie on that, kids. Come on. Top this. But, but you know, again, just so much love from, from everybody on, on, on my team and that what I'm involved with to you and your staff or what you're doing, because you are clearly and have clearly defined what winning looks like and how you can win the day and the things that you're able to do with what you shared with us and how important school nutrition is and how important, and I don't mean it in the sense of, you know, tater tots and, and, and processed fishes. I'm talking about what you, chicken coops. I'm talking about kids getting involved with compost. I'm talking about actually working to change the world through school nutrition. And that is just, it's just awesome, dude. It touches my heart. Like you cannot believe I'm so proud of what you guys are doing. I really am. It's awesome. No, thank you. I appreciate your platform and, and for us to be able to talk because you know, there there are people out here, man, they're doing wonderful things and, and sometimes they don't they don't get elevated. And, and so I, I would like to to just say thank you uh, to all of all of my colleagues, all the directors across the country that are, you know, trying to push the envelope and trying to do uh, what they do for our students. I like to thank our, our manufacturers and our distributors that are trying to get us that quality food that we want. And then I really like to also say thank you to our administrators 
uh, because they allow us to, to have the room, man. And, and yeah. if you don't have an administrator who supports what you're doing, it's very tough. And so I, I want to thank them as well. Uh, and our community organizations like Chef Ann Foundation, you know, there are a lot of other partners in, in, in this in this whole movement with us. And so I think as much as we could, you know, connect and collaborate and talk to each other and and really, you know, start to build that 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 team of people wherever you are that's working toward this one goal. And this one goal is how do we uplift and protect and serve our students? Like that's just number one. How do we Dude, I love it. I love it. We're done. That's it. We're wrapping up on that. I got nothing to come behind you. You won the day on that one, but you're hundred percent right. I love it. Thank you for being here. Please come back. You know, it's an open invitation and a shout out to anybody out there that's listening, wants to come on and tell a similar story and talk about why it's important. Find me. It's not hard to do. I'm everywhere. Like you can get us across any platform, reach out. Let's keep these stories going because it's how we're going to change our country in such a grand way. And it's really so important that we give back. And again, we take our wisdom downstream and really help to empower these children to be better choices going forward in the world. It's just going to be, it's how we win, man. It's a great legacy to give back. I'm just, thank you for being here. I truly appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Very yeah, nice. Absolutely. Everybody, thanks for listening. Thanks to the Chef Ann Foundation for their love. Thanks to all of you for your love and support on this program, making it happen and listening and pushing these messages out there for folks. It's incredibly important. And if Eric's told you one thing, he shared with you what's happening by investing in this and what the kids mean and what it means to the kids. And I think that's powerful. So thank you for listening. Remember, as Eric has inspired me today, you go out and inspire, inspire somebody because it's not hard to do. A simple hello can change somebody's day. You have no idea what their day's like. Just give people a little bit of love and some encouragement, and we can all make this place a better place for all of us in the future and for us today. Thank you for listening. Thanks for being here. We'll see you soon. Check us out on social media, all the other crap I say at the end of these broadcasts. Peace out, everybody. Take care. Take care. <laughs>